This is Simon Byrne, who's going to talk to us about how numbers are compared in Juliet. Uh, thank you. Uh, so a bit of background. This is a talk I've actually wanted to give for a few years now. Um, and so it's kind of exciting. I'm a bit excited about this. And so let's hope I can get it to 10 minutes. Uh, so why does point 0.1 greater than 1 over 10? Uh, well, of course, because each finite floating point number. So each finite floating point number corresponds to an exact floating point, to an exact real number. Um, so that's one of sort of the really nice things about floating point numbers that people often don't quite realize. Um, it's just maybe not the one you think it is. And so point 0.1 is actually that. Um, because point one, because it's stored as binary and the closest number that's representable in, bi in uh, binary base yeah, is, happens to be this decimal expansion. Uh, so if we want to compare floating point numbers, why don't we just use promote? We use that for everything else, for all the arithmetic operations. Um, and that's what most languages do. And it works you know, pretty OK in most languages. Um, but it has some downsides. So let's try it. We'll define a new equals operator. Um, which just promotes them to a common type, promotes any two real numbers to a common type. Uh, and then we get this slightly bizarre behavior. So if we do the first comparison, uh, it becomes true. If we switch the order of the arguments, it becomes false. Uh, that's not so ideal. Uh, and that's because this uh, equals, uh, CIMEC operator isn't transitive. Um, it's not a transitive relation. So uh, the first two components are true, but point one yeah, when we promote compare the float, uh, the float 64 and the float 32 version, uh, they're not equal. And so, the reason why they're not, reason why we don't do that is simply because we can do better. Okay, so there's roughly okay. Uh, there's more than this actually, but I've selected ten. Uh, there's quite a few subtypes of real in base. Um, I've selected ten of them here. Uh, there's a few extra ones, but they're not. They're usually just set special cases of these ones. Um, okay, so we need to compare 10 by 10 um, options, so that's 55 possible comparisons. So we're going to get this into 10 minutes. Let's see what we do. Uh, so how we can compare? The easiest way is if there's a way to, if LLVM provides a way to do it for us. Um, so there's LLVM but provides intrinsics for certain types. Um, the, we expose them in Julia for things like LT float. Um, you typically won't see them, but uh, if you do at code LVM, you'll see them there. There's an F comp. Um, which is the floating point comparison. Um, and if you expand that code native, you see, well, there's a bit of other nonsense there, but you can see it ultimately expands to, a, uh, to this guy, which is a, a floating point comparison of a single double, of a, of a single, yeah, one, one single double. Uh, double. Um, unlike the SIMD operation. It's kind of complicated. You, you get to read this stuff eventually. Um, okay, so that's nice and easy. And so that fills in, and there's, so there's one of those for, the integer types, the integer bits types, and the uh, floating point types. So we filled in some of the diagonal there. That's nice. Uh, the next step is the uh, we can do conversions. So certain conversions can be done losslessly. So we can convert from uint32 to uint64. Uh, we can convert from int32 to int64. Uh, we can convert from int32 to float64, and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so we can use those to fill in some gaps. Um, so we're getting there. Uh, library functions. So MPF, so big float and big int are uh, both just wrappers around C libraries, uh, and they provide some interfaces for doing comparisons. So we can use those. Um, so the dark green here are the ones it provides, and the double and the light green are the ones we get from conversions. So we filled in a few more gaps there. So slowly, slowly increasing. Uh, so how do you compare signed and unsigned integers? Uh, that seems kind of it's a little bit tricky. The main thing you have to realize is that you just check if the uh, uh, signed one is negative, and if not, you can just convert it back to a sign. You can treat it as an unsigned number. And so that's all we're doing there is check if it's less than zero. Otherwise, just treat it as an unsigned. And, uh, and so unsigned just reinterprets the signed integer as an unsigned integer. And so it's nice and fast. And, uh, and so that fills in that little gap, that little uh, unsigned signed gap there. All right, we're getting there. Ooh, four minutes. Okay, this is a fun one. Uh, this is the first really interesting one. So in sixty four, uh, so in sixty four versus float sixty four. Uh, so this is not tr not trivial. Uh, so there's a bit of complication here, but the logic's pretty straightforward. If you it was actually sorry, it was quite. It's a really neat trick. Uh, so convert the integer to a float, compare that to the float, 
Uh, if it's not equal, then we're done because the comparison uh, is determined. If it is equal, then when there may have been rounding, so they still might not actually be equal, if that makes sense. So if the floating point comparison pairs equal, there's still a chance they might not be equal. Uh, so we have to do the other comparison. So we can put them back to floats. The only thing is we have to deal with the weird edge case is if it rounded to uh, 2 to the power of 63 or 2 to the power of 64, depending if you're signed or unsigned, because they're the only potential values which can't be safely converted back. Uh, so we do that quick check and then we do another, so we convert it back and do an interesting comparison and that solves that problem. Uh, so though that seems a bit complicated, it actually isn't that bad in terms of performance. Uh, it'll be fully pipelined and the compiler is actually very good at aligning that if one of them is constant. So it'll just reduce it back down to a single comparison. Um, and as far as I'm aware, I think this is pretty original to Julia. So it was originally due to Stefan. My, Stefan made the commit, but he said it was between him and Jeff uh, made it originally. So uh, and it was later, it was originally LVM, but later it was just translated straight into Julia. Okay, so we've got all that done. Um, now into rationals. Uh, rational versus integer. Um, we can just do cross multiplication. Um, so there's a function called, we don't need check signs because the denominator is always positive and wide mull gives us a large enough integer so that you multiply two integers, it just gives you a, promotes the large enough integer type. Um, so that fills in that bit. Uh, rational versus floating point is a bit more complicated. Um, it's quite a long function. <laughs> but the logic is actually not too bad. So you check for NANDs, cross do the cross multiply again with the, but with the significant of the float. Then you check the signs, check the leading, position of the leading digit, um, and then finally, if that doesn't determine it, you just check, you then check the result of the model, um, do the uh, compare the values based on the cross multiplication. Okay, so that's all the rationals. Irrationals, actually this is surprisingly complicated. Um, so if those of you don't know what rationals are, uh, we define this constant which actually act like irrationals. Um, so for example, float 64 pi is less than pi. Um, so irrational versus float 64, we just have a, there's a function called float 64 round up, which gives you the floating point number above pi and float 64x round down, which will give you the floating point number below pi. And so you just do the comparisons using that. Um, okay, that fill, and we can fill in all that. Uh, irrational versus big float is, yeah, we just kind of just assume enough 32 bits extra precision is enough to do that comparison. So it's not strictly correct. We really should do some sort of loop and just keep adding bits until you get to there. But who's, if you're really defining these crazy rationals, then you've got bigger problems. Um, so that fills in that. Uh, that's what we do do. The problem is there's a chance that that's still, like, so big irrational compared to big pi will actually, compared to the big of the, that'll give the wrong value. So you have to add a bit extra precision because otherwise if you've just done big pi, that's a big float, not, and that will just compare equal to the thing. So you have to add a bit extra precision to check that you're actually, whether that's above or below. Because what if you got the floating point, that big, big float from that floating point, from the irrational. Uh, irrational versus irrational was actually kind of complicated. Uh, basically, we try and do the, uh, get it the closest rational approximation to the, um, to the irrational number and check and then try and compute ahead of time whether that's above or below the rational number and then choose the appropriate inequality. Um, yeah, we need to improve, that could be, technically it can't, that can't be used for rational big int though. So for that we have to do, that's not strictly correct. Um, so this something needs to be fixed. Uh, so if someone want to take this on. I have a possible idea, you just keep, you work your way down the continued fraction expansion until you can determine whether or not. Okay, one minute, perfect. So, one left. Uh, I actually thought this was trivial, uh, and so it never actually got done, until someone noticed this a month ago. <laughs> someone did report it, but it wasn't an issue. Yes, David did report it, uh, did note it a year ago, something years ago, okay. Um, so, someone put a request in, and now that's done. Uh, and they throw an, actually, they also throw an error if, it, if you try and compare two rationals that have the same floating point number but aren't the same, it'll throw an error until you define something better. So we're finished. Um, yeah. Uh, extensions, uh, it doesn't quite work for decimals yet because there's, uh, for example, if you're trying to compare decimal 1 e to the 100 to uh, 1 e to the 100, um, the floating point number, it'll tell you it's true when it's not. So we need to fix that at some point. Uh, unfortunately, it's non-trivial and there's a, yeah. So, work in progress. Um, and finally, as an epilogue, while well, doing this on Tuesday, putting this talk together on Tuesday, I, we uncovered a, a funny bug with the categorization of the Unicode operator, XIM. And so that's technically the only breaking change between 0 0.7 and 1.0. Right. Thank you. <laughs>
uh, XSIM. It thought it, so Unicode thinks it's minus SIM and HTML, so it was classified as a minus operator, whereas HTML thinks it's an equal SIM, and so it's treating it as a like, binary predicate. So. <laughs> so we think Unicode's wrong on it, and we'll go with what HTML things. So yeah, thanks for the talk, and never feel secure with comparing numbers in Julia now. Um, <laughs> otherwise, why in the in the first function? So before the big int and big floats, most yep. of the functions were using uh, were not using short circuits, so single ampersand and single or. While afterwards, it was the case. Sorry, what was sorry the question? Uh, it was not using short circuiting, so one single ampersand. Uh, basically, because they're all, uh, the compiler just gets rid of all that. It, um, yeah. I, we originally didn't, it was actually faster without short circuiting because um, it's probably should be fine now, but originally because it can it sort of pipeline. Be the right either one, but sometimes the compiler needs them to move yeah, I think it was just Usually pipe. You don't want branches. Yeah, I think it was just full, because it could, well. yeah, fully pipeline it. Yeah. yeah. Thanks.